Hello, good evening everyone. How are we feeling? <laughs> That's great. My name is Alima. I am the lead curator for Beyond the Baseline, 500 years. <laughs> And it's such a joy and pleasure to be here this evening, uh, to be, you know, opening this incredibly important event. As this event is situated as part of Beyond the Baseline, I thought it was important to kind of introduce a little bit about the work that we've been doing here at the British Library. So for those that do not know, Beyond the Baseline is a partnership project between the University of Westminster, um, the Black Music Research Unit headed up by Dr. Michael Riley, who is somewhere in this room. <laughs> and the partnership is about thinking about Black British musical heritage. It's thinking about, you know, the ways in which musicians of African and Caribbean heritage has transformed the landscape of British culture, British society. So for those of you who had a chance to look at the exhibition, you know, it's really kind of looking at Black British music as a conversation through time and space, a conversation that has transformed um, a lot of what we think of when we think about popular culture. And no better way to you know, be part of this conversation than to be host in this conversation. The events uh, series is a really exciting way for me to kind of continue the conversation outside of the exhibition, to think about you know, amazing legendary musicians and bring them you know, into conversation with, with, with the audience. And it's a real honor and a real joy that we have Joan Armour trading tonight. <laughs> So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to introduce Jacqueline Springer, who is hosting the In Conversation with Joan Armour Trading, and pass it on to Jacqueline. So Jacqueline is the curator of Africa Diaspora Performance at the Victoria, the v &A, in the muse, uh, museum in London. She began her media career in print, writing for a number of specialist music titles before moving on to lifestyle publications, broadsheet newspapers, international music, imprint and music-related websites, and has worked for the BBC Radio, contributing to discussions on contemporary music, culture, and representation. So it's safe to say that you're in really good hands tonight. And just to add, she's also working on the uh, exhibition at the V&A, which will open next year, um, which I'm sure she might um, be welcome to speak in a little bit about. So without further ado, uh, please, please, please put your hands together for Joan Armour Trading and Jacqueline Springer. Thank you so much. And I'd just like to say, I've, I've got about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Joan Armour Trading, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> this is not the first time you've had a sold out audience in your career, but it is one of the first times that you've had a public event where you're in conversation. And I think that that contributes. Look at that, I didn't, didn't even spill it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that contributes. The fact that it's sold out is because you don't do this often. No, I don't do this kind of thing. I don't like these people. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't uh, I don't do this kind of thing. Um, in fact, I think this might be perhaps the second time I've done something like this. Um, one time, uh, the only time I remember was in um, Cheltenham at the book thing. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from maybe going on a chat show or something, no, I've never done this. What made you decide? Was it because of the... I have no idea. I must admit, <laughs> <laughs> out of my head. <laughs> but it's, it's not daunting. It's not daunting. So, I mean, I, you may recognise this woman, but what we're looking at here is a career that's lauded. It's, you've infested charts internationally. You've made history in doing so from this country. And I want to just um, have an evening of loud reflection and celebration, mm -hmm. and you're in the room, 
I think it's better to do it that way than yeah, so. you're not here. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> what was music like for you? When did you think it speaks to me in a different way than the rest of us? Um, I think I always answer that question because you're not the first to ask oh. that question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I always answer that question by saying I was born to write. I was born to make music. This is why I'm here, and I think I'm very lucky that I know why I'm here, because everybody kind of is questioning, you know, what, what's it all about. Um, but when I, when I was growing up, um, I started writing probably when I was maybe 13, 14, maybe 12 even. But when I was growing up, I was really into comedy. Right. That's what I loved. I loved comedy. I still do. So I would listen to The Clear the Road Kid, Around the Horn, Beyond That Can, all of those programs. I absolutely loved them. Um, and I used to, I actually used to write um, um, uh, jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you'd ever find any of those jokes, but they used to go in a little local magazine in, in Birmingham. Um, oh, you'd send them in? And Well, oh. not, yeah, my brother... Um, it had something to do with putting on a magazine and, and I used to write stuff for that. Um, so I was really, really into that. But the, even though I know I was born to it, it wasn't until my mother got the piano. She, she just thought, a great piece of furniture, let me get this piano. She, she had the place in the sitting room that it would go. And literally, as soon as it arrived, I started writing uh, songs. I just taught myself, I just played. Um, just made stuff up, because that's, that's actually what writing is about, is yes. making stuff up. <laughs> but it comes from an observational perspective, doesn't it? You know, yes. the humour, you, you have to know how to target it, the delivery of it, and I'm, you know, your career is, is just, it's rich in observation and the dialogue that comes through. So, you know, the fact that you're talking about um, writing jokes, it's, it's about that interplay. And, um, but before we um, come back to your um, childhood in, in, in Birmingham, I'm quite interested in the Ketitian music and how that, well, how I, that I don't furnished know, you. I don't know that that, because I left St Kitts when I was three, left Antigua when I was seven, and, and I've lived in, in uh, England ever since yeah. I was seven. And my parents, they didn't really play a lot of West Indian music as such. Mm -hmm. um, so. The, the music that, I'm, that I was hearing was more what I was being presented with. Here? Here. Because mm -hmm. um, they used to play, like, my mum's favourite uh, artist was Jim Reeves. OK. <laughs> she loved Jim Reeves. So she liked, you know, country and western and bluegrass stuff. Mm -hmm. And my dad's was uh, Nat King Cole. OK. Um, nice. So, yeah, and the very first record that I asked my parents to buy me was Gracie Fields. It's going back a bit. <laughs> And uh, she had a song called Little Donkey, if you know that song, and on the B side of that was a song called Carefree Heart, which mm -hmm. I loved. That's why I got my mum to buy me that. So it wasn't for Little Donkey? It wasn't for Little Donkey, no. <laughs> um, so I, I, it, was just, it was just in me. It was, it was no, there was no plan. There was no, there was no kind of hearing somebody on the radio uh, and thinking, oh, yeah, they sound good, I'd like to do that. It wasn't, it wasn't any of that. It was simply my mum having the piano. Right. Yeah. So in your, in your family, how many siblings do you have? Where do you fall in the birth order? So I'm kind of in the middle. I've got four brothers and a sister. OK. And could you be heard, you know, when you have a family, when you've got... Oh, sometimes, depending on where you fall in, you're either heard or you're the one that speaks. I'm wondering, I'm trying to analyse here, <laughs> um, as to whether the jokes, the, the love of literary, you know, uh, having a literary pen, if that comes from being heard in a different way and in a different context? Um, I, I was quite a loner. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote a song called Me, Myself, I. That's probably... That was a hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I quite liked my own company. So even within the family, I was quite uh, used to being on my own. Yeah. Um, and when you, when you write, I think any creative person needs quite a lot of space and a lot of time on their own to be able to, to do that. So I was very happy just to be by, my, be by myself and just, just write. So, you know, you, you mentioned before that 
this kind of affair is not something is untypical. But what I do remember when I picked my jaw up off the floor when I saw you on the one show. <laughs> John Armour training in an interview on television. Um, you were talking about your childhood guitar because you were banned from touching your father's guitar. Yes. So you could touch the piano, yes. even though it was purchased as furniture. Yes. You could you could <laughs> use it as an instrument. But tell us about because um, usually most children have that. Do not touch the record player. Mm. Do not touch the blues spot. But it was the it was the guitar. It was the guitar. So my father had this um, guitar. Uh, a nameless guitar and uh, he would we, we lived in a house and it had like a what we call the cellar but it was like a big room at the side of the house and it had a, a steel door that was a bit like a bank vault door really seriously heavy wow and uh, so he would <laughs> he would hide his guitar in that room <laughs> And not only would he put it in that room, but he'd put it on the topmost shelf. <laughs> and so, uh, because, because he said I shouldn't touch it and he would hide it, I really wanted to play that guitar. I wanted, I, I was like, you know, I really, really wanted to. And so he wouldn't let me, but I, then one day I saw um, a guitar in a pawn shop and I said to my mum, can I have that? And it cost three pounds. And she said, well, we don't have the money, but if they'll swap, the two prams, she had two old prams. If they'd swap that, then I could have the guitar. So that's how I got my first guitar, which I still have. And um, it's, it's an awkward guitar for, for the age I was yeah, to, to, to be able to play it. Um, but I just kind of took it. My, my father did teach me how to tune it, which was the only thing he ever showed me. And it's a little, silly little tune that he played to tune it, which I sometimes still, still use. Mm -hmm. um, but that was it, and even when I would play my guitar, he didn't want me to play my guitar. <laughs> Why? Well, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. Terrible. And I know, you know, my one of my brothers used to laugh at me as well when I would play the guitar or, or <laughs> write songs and th stuff like that, which is fine. He's not laughing now, no. is he? <laughs> he hasn't been laughing since 1972, has he? <laughs> I don't think. So, um... And do, f do feel free to correct me, but did you find a confidence, you were talking about being alone, did you find a confidence in creating a kind of a worldly narrative? This is, I'm talking about before you um, were signed, <coughs> by writing songs, because there are characters, there's dialogue, there's observation, you know, there's peace yeah. in sleep. Yeah, yeah, I, I <laughs> feel very confident, always have done, about writing. Mm. Um, Almost to a point of being big-headed. I don't mind saying that. Go for um, it. You are that girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I've never had any kind of misgivings, any doubts, any second thoughts about could I do this? I just knew I could do it. And, and nobody showed me how to, to do any of the bits that I do. I remember <clears throat> even when I started uh, my career, and I would say to guitarists, can you show me how, how do you do this bit? Or, or, or if I want, because I really wanted to play lead guitar, I said, "How do you do that bit? How do you?" And nobody would ever show me. So you know, I just, well, just get on with it myself, and which I did. And and somebody mentioned to me the other day, um, they said, you, "You know, it's it's quite a thing to have taught yourself to play in the way that you do, um, because there was no YouTube yeah. at that time. There was, no there, was, there was nowhere to go to say, okay, this is how you do it. So yeah, pretty but good. I think." I think there's something quite saddening and quite interesting about the gatekeeping of knowledge that you've just expressed there, both yeah. from your both from your father and from men in studios that you'd like show me how to do that. Mm. Because without that tutelage, it's presumed you'd give up. Absolutely, yes. I mean, somebody once said to me, I said, I said, how do you how do you do that particular thing? And, and they said. Oh no! You need to know this, 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 and this, and this before you can know this. And then they said, even some men never get past that stage, <laughs> which I thought was funny. <laughs> He's not laughing now, is he? <laughs> We're just racking up these people who, who tried. Yeah. Did you punch him? No. You didn't no. punch him. Fair enough. No. So. Thinking about music on the radio, we're, you know, you mentioned the internet there, but we're in a completely different time period when you're growing up because radio really was 
ping, mm. you know, we'll play that after the news. So you'd yeah. hang around until after the news. Yeah. The DJs really had so much enormous disseminatory power. Mm. But I'm interested in, you've got the songwriting knack. From before you were a teenager, you've, you're creating s scenarios for stories, mm. for messages. So when you're listening to the radio, are you actually critiquing the material that's coming out? No. What, what no, impact does it have I on just it? think, oh, how clever are you to have written that? That's, that's what I think. I, I listen to the things and, and I think that's so... The, the talent to have made up that bit of music or written those particular words. And, and sometimes when I hear something on the radio, I, I know all the words to that thing. Not because I, I consciously sat down to learn them, mm -hmm. but I think it's just because I'm interested right. in you know, the creation of it, so that so I, I kind of know the words. No, not at all. I, I just think, oh, just super clever. Because, mm. you know, when, often when you f you have the kind of cultural exposure to something that you're very interested in, you're often almost trying to get into the radio to try and become a, almost a peer to the music that's coming out, and it's it's washing over you in a way that's quite inspirational. Well, it's uh, it's... I, I certainly admire it, but I don't. I, I have a I have a, a, a bit of a problem sometimes with with the word influence and inspiration because I sometimes think it means you're trying to uh, imitate. No. And yeah. and and that's not what it what it is. So I, I just try and um, just enjoy what I do, but but love what other people do as well. And I and, and another question that I'm asked is, do you wish you'd written that song? I won't ask you that. No. <laughs> That'd be rude, but frankly. I can, but I can answer the I, I can answer the question. What question? Uh, what um? What song do you wish you? <laughs> uh, no, none. <laughs> none, because I think I don't want to take away from that the skill of that person mm. to have written that song. Yeah. I just want to admire them mm. for for writing that song. Um, and I just, again, I just think, oh, how clever are you to have yeah. done that? You know, we're just listening to. Um, um, Amy Winehouse on the way, the guy was playing the, the, the radio and she was on singing um, Rehab. Just fantastic, mm. you know, and, and a little bit ironic as well, but... Yes, absolutely. Sadly. She was, she, I thought she was fantastic. So you mentioned you were alone. When did, what, do you recall the first concert you went to? Yes, <clears throat> the first concert I went to... Well, I'm not sure how this happened. I, I would go walking on my own, <clears throat> and then I'd go up to, because I grew up in Birmingham, and would go up to town, and one day I went up um, to, to town, and the Beatles were there. Uh, I wasn't, I mean, not that I don't like the Beatles, but I wasn't interested in seeing the Beatles. I, it just happened to be there. You're just the best. <laughs> but but, but um, Georgie Fame, there was a poster for Georgie Fame. Uh, and I thought, oh, I'd quite like to see that. So I went on my own, and I saw to see Georgie Fame, but the very first person who came on was uh, Chris Farlow. Okay. So Chris Farlow was the first person that I saw in concert, mm -hmm. um, which was great. And Georgie Fame actually ended up playing on my album. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, does that, what does that feel? Because it's, it's a secret that you know until you tell them. Yeah. Uh, no. It's a full... It's a full I mean, time. again, just a very, very talented guy. Lovely guy as well. Very talented. Um, so, you know, I... The producer that I worked with, Glyn Johns, and I don't know if you guys know Glyn Johns, but he's one of the best producers. And I was lucky enough to have Gus Dudgeon, who produced... <laughs> Elton John's best albums, I still think, mm -hmm. uh, and and Glyn, <clears throat> and Glyn worked with the Who and the the, the Stones, the Beatles, uh, Eric Clapton, Georgie. I mean, he worked with the Eagles. You name it, he's worked with those guys. Um, and uh, hang on, I've lost my thought. Sorry. Oh, you were just talking about you know working coming that full circle by you went. Oh, with George. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's what I, so that's why I got to Glenn because Glenn is the one who's introduced me to Georgie Fame. Yes. And th and that's how I tended to work with producers as well. Is that I would rely on the producer to introduce me to musicians because mm -hmm. I I didn't know anybody. Sure. You know. So um, he would say, oh, let's use Georgie or whoever, and that's how I get to know them.
Lovely. So you, you mentioned, I'm, I'm just going to draw a parallel if I may. It may be a long question. OK. But it is a question. OK. Um, so the, the writer and academic Carol Phillips talked about um, having a particular friend that he could go to concerts with because they weren't going to a typical concert. They weren't going to, oh, they're in town. OK, we must get tickets. And they'd go to Queen. They'd go to, to concerts that, why are you going there as a black guy? And you grew up in the home of British reggae in Birmingham. You're, you also grew up in the home of heavy metal in Birmingham. So musically, when we hear your first album, it's teeming with the vocal stylizations of folk. We're hearing elements of jazz musicality in there. So tell us how we get from the loner who's traveling her own musical avenue through the live circuit to who decides that that's how they want to express themselves, that that's the best way. Um, when I... When I started to write, um, I wasn't... I just had this conversation with somebody about influence and, and, and how it happens. But when I started to, to write, I didn't feel as if I was being influenced by anything or any, anyone. I just felt that it was just something I wanted to do. So because I knew that music was about a bass and a drum and a guitar and a piano, and so, when I started to write and play the guitar, I tried to do all of those things on the guitar at the same time. Yeah. And that's how my style developed, because I was trying to do the rhythm, do the lead, do the, yes. you know. Um, and so I, I just kind of, I just did that. I didn't, I wasn't kind of thinking of anything else. It wasn't, it wasn't a question of, well, let me go this way or let me be influenced by that or let me, it was, and I, I write like that still. I just think, what do I want to do? I want to do this, let me do it, that's it. Mm. Very, very simple, very basic. You say that, but... <laughs> it's not basic, sorry. It, it feels basic to me, and, yeah. I, and, and I've said this before, I feel as if I can't take credit for what I do, because I had kind of nothing to do with it apart from doing it. You feel you're a vessel? <laughs> it comes through it, you. Yes, it, I, I, you know, nobody said, Joan, you must do this, and nobody said, this is how you do it, and, and, and when I'm writing my words, nobody says, well, you must write it like this, or... I just yeah. kind of just just do it, yeah. and and you know when I'm writing it, I can write quite quickly, and I've never had. You, know, you hear people talk about writer's block. I've never had writer's block. I don't know what really what that is. I think it's meant to be when you can't write. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what I what maybe my equivalent of writer's block is that I will write something and it's rubbish. That's that's why I think that's part of the writer's book, yeah. When you just can't seem to get yeah. it. But but I'll write it and any song I start to write, I'll finish. I don't have lots of unfinished songs up. Because I think if I don't finish that one, I might not be able to finish the next one. So I always finish the songs. But um yeah, it's, it'll just be something that I don't particularly like, but I'll I'll finish it. That's that's my my um experience of writing book. But it's not it's never a case of I really want to write something and I can't. Mm. When, did, when did it become, when did the idea of music becoming a profession intervene? <clears throat> because you could have continued to live a life and absorb music and, and to write. When did it become? I think it was very, very early on. And I, I actually just the other day looked at, a, at a, a, a letter that I got from, I think it's Chapel Music, mm -hmm. so that would be, you know, like 60s probably. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd sent them some songs that I'd written. Oh. And when I, when I um, sent the thing, it was on a tape, and I'd recorded the songs on both sides. So the, the guy wrote back to say, well, we could kind of hear it, and we think it's really interesting, but we're hearing the double. Can you resend? But I didn't, I didn't resend. Why? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was too soon to... What, what age were you, do you reckon? Oh, I'd be, I'd be young. I'd be maybe 15, maybe. Yeah. See, it's your instincts, your instinct guiding yeah. you the whole way. So then, so, so what was the time scale between that and just thinking, I am going to send this somewhere, I, I, I've got this 
this I, body of work that I'm amassing. Yeah, I think once, once I started to write, I, I loved writing, I, I still do, uh, but I never, <laughs> I never wanted to be famous. <laughs> I never wanted to be, be, be a front person. That wasn't my aim. My aim was to be just a really good songwriter. People would hear the songs, they'd all sing them, and then I'd just be this kind of not known person in the back. <laughs> you kind of did that though, because look. Yeah. <laughs> the first time. You, you, yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, it's, it's all right, people knowing you, That's, I, I don't have a problem with it, but. Um, <laughs> It's kind of not the be all and end all, is it? I, th I think what's the be all and end all for me is that people know the songs, yeah. they love the songs, they associate the songs. People use the songs at, at the weddings, at funerals, mm. at breaking up. Um, I did a, a, an interview with a guy. Breaking up? Yeah, they, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 yeah. They do it. They, I, I did an interview with a, with, a, with a chap, and he said, John, when I finish this interview, I'm going to propose to my girlfriend with your songs. How cute is, yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Did he, though? Well, I'm presuming he did. I never... <laughs> Might be here tonight, Joan. It wasn't... <laughs> but, you know, when you, 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 you did an, a documentary that was aired on the BBC a couple of times, and you, you said that you wanted to just be a songwriter. You were going to give your songs, you know, you were going to have mm. a publishing deal, you were going to do that. And, um, and you would have been quite happy. Very happy, that. yes. You know, but you've retained the reticence that you speak of. You've retained it, and you've allowed there to be, you know, a boundary that uh, you know respectfully people don't cross. And I think that you know, whether pre or post or mi you know, mid internet, there's something really quite vital about the protection that you've. Yeah, I I think for, I think for all of us, we do need some privacy. You know, I, I, I love technology, I'm, I'm totally for it. I, when I made my records, I started off with my guitar and my little two-track machine, or, and then my four-track, my eight-track, my 16-track, my 24-track. Mm. Computers came in, I did the, the computer. Yeah. Whatever technology is there, I had the, the massive desk, you know, um, and now my desk is like that. Yeah. Um, when I would go on tour, my my um, guitar rig was literally this high, this wide, and like a light show. Yeah. And it would take however many um, roadies to, to get it on, on stage. And then <laughs> with technology, the, 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 the stuff that was in that one was in a box this big. Yeah. That, I'm sorry to say, was like could buy a house, and this could buy a little handbag. Yeah. I mean, it was the, the, the difference is, is huge. It's huge. Um, so technology is, is great, um, and the internet is great, but I do think we need privacy. You, you don't necessarily need to see your dinner on the internet. I mean, you know, do you? I, maybe you do, I don't know. But <laughs> there's, there's certain things that you need to keep for yourself, for your family, for your friends. And obviously, there's certain things that if you want to share with the wider world, yes, but not everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think sometimes that when you share everything, sometimes you could be putting yourself at, at risk. You know, I remember when they had um, um, MTV and they used to do cribs. I've never understood that. I've yeah. watched it, but yeah. I've never understood it. Well, well the, the, the premise of that was that <laughs> you would show your house and you'd show them the room and this is where the magic happens and you'd get, do all of that stuff. And then the next thing, they're being robbed. <laughs> and so many of those guys who did cribs yeah, because you've got, given people the blueprint to your home. Absolutely. So it's, it, I mean, it's great showing off. No, nothing wrong with showing off. But, um, <laughs> but I think you do need privacy. So I like, I like to keep certain things private between me and friends and family. There's, there's no need for everybody to, to know everything. But you see, John Armour Trading, OBE, CBE, the issue that we have here is that your right to privacy, which you've retained and um, successfully, it clashes with your artistry because your artistry is so personal, it, or it's, it, presumes it presumes to be personal, personal. because you, you, you're delivering the first person, yes. and also because it ricochets into the lived experiences of listeners. So yes. they think that you understand them, yes. that you were there. 
that I'm going to I'm going to propose to my girlfriend. Do you see what I mean? And so yes. there's this. When did that? When did it become clear that? No, no offence. That they didn't get it, <laughs> but you understood it, and that was going to be something that you'd have to manage for the rest of your career. No, I never. I, I kind of knew for, because this is this is how I've always been. Mm. This from at school, from little, from young. Yeah. So I haven't had to adapt to be this. Mm. This is what I, this is it. So people have to adapt to you. Yeah, because I, I don't know a, another way of being, yeah. you know? So it, to, it seems a big deal to other people, but to me, it's not, not a big deal. Um, I just, I, as I say, I just think it's quite important to have uh, yeah. uh, some privacy. And I don't feel the pressure to, divulge everything, probably because I've never given myself that pressure, yeah. you know. Yeah. Let's talk about some of your lyrics, because okay. what's lovely about the book, and I know that um, there are several hundred copies outside that you're going to sign for the <laughs> audience, so buy some merch, um, after, the, after our talk, but you presented your lyrics there, so we can, you know, people have felt them, they've you know, and I, it may sound a little bit reductive, and I certainly don't hope it, that it lands that way, but I firmly believe that you've given, that you've articulated the feelings of people growing in a way that they can't articulate them specifically. Mm -hmm. But certainly that time when people tend to look back on when they're in their middle age, when it seemed that the world was open to you, mm -hmm. but it was very difficult to, you know, emotionally mm -hmm. navigate and articulate when the love of family mm -hmm. s starts to be engulfed by a love for another yeah. person or another. Yeah. And this, this is a revelation that somebody else, external to the home, has control over your emotional and your, you know, your every waking thought. And yeah. just some of the beautiful ways in which you've articulated that. And, you know, with love and affection, I know you've got more songs than that. <laughs> but there's something that's so quintessentially brilliant about where you said, you know, you can dance with your friends, but with a love, you can, you can yeah. really throw yourself back. Yeah. I just want to um, ask you, you know, how that feels when you absolutely nail it, when you actually see the scene created and furnished by words. Yeah. The, the way I write, the, the majority of the songs, of course, some songs are about me, me, myself, I. That's me just saying, you know, it's, it's, quite, it's great to, to have your own space. Yeah. Um, but the majority of the songs are written from observation. They're written from looking at different scenes. Uh, sometimes people will tell me things. Uh, if, if somebody tells me something and says, Jones, this will make a great song, that song doesn't get written. Yeah. But, if I, but if I see something, <laughs> Um, it just sparks it off. Um, so, like for instance, there's a song of mine called The Shouting Stage. Mm -hmm. And I was in Australia and I, and I was in a restaurant and this couple were having this huge argument, a huge argument in the restaurant. And the guy eventually just got up, stormed out, and the woman was left crying. And I was thinking, what, what got them to the shouting stage? Why are they in a restaurant? shouting at each other like this. Um, and so I wrote, wrote that song. Now, I can bet you nobody else went home and wrote that song. <laughs> nobody else thought, yeah, I'll write that. <laughs> um, and that's just from observation and just kind of, if you like, putting myself in their shoes, yes. trying to think, well, why did that happen? Uh, I wrote a song called Everyday Boy. Mm. And in Everyday Boy, it's about a, a chap who had AIDS. And his boyfriend, uh, his boyfriend's mother, thought that her son would die as well because they were together. Yeah. And he was telling me the story of his, how, he, how his boyfriend's mother was not very nice to him. But he was doing it in such a compassionate, caring, understanding way. Um, and he got up and he looked in the mirror. And so all the things that happened in the song, I saw him do. Right. And even as he was telling me the story, I was writing the lyrics. Yeah. And then I went home and wrote the, wrote the song. So certain things, just, you can't help it. As, as a creative, you're looking at these things and you're observer, observing and you're 
really taking it in, you're drinking it in. Uh, Mark Knopfler wrote a song called Money for Nothing. Mm. And the way he wrote that song was he was in a, a store in, in New York, I think it was, a blind store that MTV was on the television. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, look at them on the MTV. That's not, that's not working. That's money for nothing. <laughs> and so he wrote that song. Again, nobody else in that store wrote that song. Well, maybe the guy has a little PRS there. But what you've described there, um, it's emotional documentation. You know, you're, you're a documentarian in, in many yes. respects. Yes, yes, and, I, and I, I like to, I, I try and write so that it's not necessarily everyday words, because sometimes I hear songs and they're everyday words which is fine because people like that, but I like to get your imagination going as well, you know, so. But I do like it, I love it when people say to me, this song means so much to, to me, it's it helped me to express something to somebody else, um, it's comforted me. My mom used to say to me, play Willow so I can cry, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, you, you know, it's, it's for me to have that kind of thing happen, it's, just, it's absolutely wonderful. And this is what all writers want, not just me, all people who are creating, whether it's a novel or a, a song or a play, they, they want to touch people. Nobody, nobody writes something and think, I hope nobody likes this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. So let's talk about um, how you market art. Because when you, <laughs> the fear. <laughs> let's talk about A&M, because um, they, they, they issued some interesting um, oh, adverts. Is this the free, is this the free, free oh. But they didn't have a clue, actually. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about it. And it's, it's so much better when you did, because it, then it just makes it easier for me to join in. But there was one where, it's, um, it's, where it began with, Joan's not a black artist. Da, da, da. And what's so interesting about the music industry is that it's reliant <coughs> upon art. And yeah. it's reliant upon you and others being able to create material that they distribute. And yet they have, in, within that arrangement, they harness so much power to tell people and to tell the artists what they are and what, what their potential is. And, you know, given that we're looking back at an, a quite an illustrious career, let's be frank, um, I wonder how you can now sit back and think about how that felt, because you're in complete control of your creative endeavours. Yes. Well, I can tell you how I felt about this and the, the uh, free journal trading uh, thing. It was, I felt very embarrassed. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I can kind of understand why they did some of what they did, because at the point of me um, making my music and people being introduced to, to it at first, there wasn't really another person doing that. Yeah. <clears throat> there might have been black women singing gospel songs and, and um, soul, you know, yeah. blues and things. But, but, but they weren't singing the songs that I was singing with the words and the rhythm style. And, and the, yeah. So they didn't really know how to say, this is a black person doing this kind of music, you know, have a go listening to this. So they didn't quite know how to position it. And I think that's was them searching for a way to say to people, listen, um, maybe they should have just, you know, got people to play the music more and just, <laughs> just let that yeah. talk, you know. Uh, because that's kind of what happened here. When John Peel played my music on the radio, people got to know me. Um, um, uh, they probably questioned it a little bit, but, but they were hearing it, so yes. it wasn't quite the same. I'm just going to sit in the in the discomfort that this kind of discussion um, invites, because if you're going to be the first of something, it's because you weren't permitted or it didn't exist prior. Um, but there have been black women making music since time immemorial. Yes. But how they're marketed and what they're permitted to play, don't do that, you work with that. You've got a better voice now, why don't you sing back up? There's a structuring in how and where you can be. That, that gatekeeping you talked about, Oh, you won't be able to do that, love. Mm. I'll do it. You know, so the fact that you continued 
it is revelatory. And I just want us to think about that because you continue to make music when, well, how do we market you? You know, the, the, the slide of all of so many of your albums, you can see people trying to work out how to Words depict it, yes. your sound. Yeah, I mean, they had a, they had a, a problem with my name, just my name. They said, we have to change your name. Nobody's going to remember Joan Armatrade. <laughs> Um, so, so, and then they said you must dress more girly and you must sing other people's songs. And I, I've never sung on anybody else's songs on any of my albums. Yes. Um, so you, they say you, you've got to do this if you want people to know who you are and to, to have success. But I wasn't looking for that kind of success. I think that's probably the biggest part of it. If I was looking to be really super famous and all of that, then maybe I would have gone along with it. But I, what I was looking for was fame for my songs. For I, your songs? For my songs, yes. yes. It, wasn't, it wasn't me, it didn't, yes. didn't matter. Um, be quite happy just walking down the street and nobody said hello. Not now, of course, <laughs> not, <laughs> not these days. Too late. But, <laughs> too late. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I just I just wanted people to know the songs, and and it's still the, it's still the same, you know. When I when I make uh, an, an album, uh, by the way, I do have a new album that will be coming out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when? <laughs> well, I, I I think it'll be this year. It's finished. I've made it already. But title. 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 Shall I tell you the title? Yeah. yeah. Exclusively yeah. The, revealed. As okay. The, the title is, how did this happen, and what does it now mean? <laughs> Yeah, How many songs? Title. Twelve songs. Oh. Yeah. But I, I love writing, so I'm not, I'm not about to stop. I'll stop when I'm dead. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll go on even after that. <laughs> <laughs> you might have the fault, like your dad's fault. There's more in there. There's more there. Yeah. So, um, in terms of your representation, you know, in terms of management, etc., did you have anyone fighting with you, or was this a solo battle to... To be there in jeans, in a shirt, to wear your hair as you as you want, and I don't care how many people are like, why are they talking about it? It matters because you, Linda Lewis, Phil Linert, mm -hmm. to see people on television. There's a black person on television. <laughs> Phil Linert's on television. <laughs> it mattered, but to see that self-reflection, um, I'm very interested in what was happening in the mechanics behind the scene to be yourself. Yeah. Even though you didn't want to be there. Yeah, but I, I just have to go back to what I said to the Honourable Lady a few moments ago. Um, <laughs> I'm just being me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to be uh, uh, anything else. It's no good saying to me, Joan, you must wear this or be this or play it, because I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I only know how to be Joan. Was there so the, so, they, so the, the pressure that you, somebody would feel when people tell, t say to them, do, I don't feel. Right. Because I know I don't need to do it. But usually what tends to happen, artists are punished. You know, they're put in limbo, they're dropped. W was there no, no fear of that for no. you? No. <laughs> no. And we're the better for it, but I'm just yeah. really interested in that weight. No. Of... And, and if you go back to a and &M, a and &M were a really good uh, record company because they were very artist-led. Uh, they, they would allow an artist, my, my, it was my third album that was successful. Yes. So I did, uh, 72 was my first album, 75 the next one, and 76 um, was the next one. Yeah. And in those days, you, make, you practically made an album every year. So you're going 72, 75, 76, 78, 77, 78, 79, 80, 82. I mean, you know, it's yeah. just on and on. And I'm just, as you see, just constantly writing. Yeah. Um, but a and they liked artists and they recognised that you wouldn't necessarily have a big success on the first album. So they allowed, they had artist development. Yes. You know, they allowed artists to develop. Yeah, it was, an, it was a label co-founded by Herb Alpert. Yeah, like so, mentioned. yeah, Herb Alpert. So there was Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. Yes. And it was the Jerry Moss, the M of A&M that signed me to A&M. And he came over to uh, the UK and um, I'm not sure if he came over specifically to sign me, but the record label that I was in uh, with then, he kind of took me off there and, yeah. and, and I went with A&M. And I was with them for absolute years and uh, they obviously were very happy with, with what I was doing. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm really enjoying this. I'm just worried about time, so let's have a look at this. You were everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, when people are saying, you know, well, she doesn't make black music, we're going to come to that, of course. But what's so really <coughs> deeply moving about your existence on the planet and the fact that you've given us this music is that you infiltrate <laughs> so many different um, avenues of representation. And so you're on musician magazines and musician magazines, but you know, yeah. instrument magazines and the technology yeah. and you were, you're one of the first cover, cover stars on um, Black Echoes, etc. And I just wonder if you could take us back to, you know, you were talking about that, the sheer pace of things, you know, an album, an album, an mm. album, you know. I think it was maybe until the mid nineties, there was that understanding, you get, you get three, three albums, three tries, mm. and then maybe mm. you're out. Mm. But when you hit, as you did with album three, mm. it becomes stratospheric, mm. doesn't it? You know, the idea of stadia, the certainly tra um, touring and performing mm. internationally. Mm. You are an international success mm. story. You're yeah. writing, you're arranging. Yeah. And that's quite incredible to go to somewhere like Japan and people are singing your, they're singing Riro. <laughs> but they're singing it, they're singing, you know, and you go to Czechoslovakia and um, they keep the lights on and the guards are there with the guns because they don't want people to have too much of a good time. Uh, at that time, at that time. Um, in fact, just, just the other day, somebody came up to me and they said, I saw you in Serbia. <laughs> Um, you know, so so you you get the opportunity to go and just play all these different places. It's it's just amazing, and they know your songs. How incredible is that? And and the connection to the songs, even though the language is not their first language, the connection to the songs is exactly the same. Yes. You know, and that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so yeah, I, I just feel very very fortunate that I was able to. Um, to have this kind of uh, career and to, to go into, you know, play uh, arenas, to play big outdoor gigs and, um, and just have everybody turn up and like it. It's fantastic. Like tonight. <laughs> Let's talk about the folk hierarchy. Bob Dylan, you know, yeah, inviting you. <laughs> Come and play at my picnic. Yes. What I love about these two <laughs> big um, posters is that you could have called Harvey Goldsmith direct. His phone number's on there. You could have popped <laughs> along to his offices on Great New Bond Street. This is upper echelon stuff. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that teenager who's recording on, on the double-sided tape, she's listening to Dylan and to Joan. And eventually, within in less than a decade, you're being asked by Bob Dylan to play. Yeah. Tell us about that crossing over of into the arms of people that you listen to. Well, I, I obviously, I mean, and even now, I, I don't know who's listening to my music, but he obviously listened and liked it. And everybody that was on that bill, he asked to be on that bill. Mm. So it's his choice. And, and I think that concert is still the biggest concert of um, a, a, a solo artist, even, even now. Um, but that was, yeah, it was absolutely huge, uh, the, the whole experience. It was very, kind of, kind of surreal to, to stand and look at the sea of people. Yes. Um, I, met, <laughs> I met Ringo Starr uh, at, the, at that gig, and we both stood there like idiots, not knowing what to say before. to each other. <laughs> there was a possibility you could have met him a few I, years I before, could've, but you but kicked I, it off for Georgie. I Spain. didn't yet. <laughs> no, I, I, I just I met him. Um, and subsequently we met all the other guys apart from uh, John Lennon. But um, no, the, the opportunity is there. When you, when you get asked to do something like that, there's no hesitation. Yes. You don't say, can you give me five minutes? Oh. <laughs> you just say, yeah, thank you. Um, but it's a sheer variety as well, and, and it speaks to the musicality that you utilise, that you travel across on the fretboard, you know, with George Duke, you're, you're playing oh, soul and jazz and folk and, and the music that 
many of you came into this evening, um, it was chosen because of the introductions and how you actually have the, the guitar string singing in different ways before we even hear your voice. Yeah. And so let's talk about um, your multi-instrumentality. <laughs> so you, you once said, Prince plays all his, <laughs> all his instruments, he's a genius, yeah. I play it and I'm greedy. Yes. So. That's what they say. I play it and I'm greedy or a control freak, mm. which is quite strange. Um, the only reason I play a lot of things uh, is because I'm writing and I want to hear, well, what should the bass play or what should the keyboard play? Yeah. Um, what should the, what, how should the drums uh, sound? Mm. So it's not, it's not because I want to necessarily play a lot of stuff. It's just because I want to write a lot of stuff. So you, you would want me in your band playing maybe the guitar, piano, uh, key, uh, key, whatever, but you would, and mandolin maybe, but you wouldn't want me playing other things, certain other things, because I'm only able to do it for the thing that I'm writing. Oh, yes. And then after I've written it, I'm, I'm finished with it, you know. Yes. Um, but it's, it's, just, it's, just a nice, it's just a nice thing to do. And I have to say, I, the, most, if not all of the musicians that I know, play more than one instrument. Yeah. All musicians will play the bass, and the drummer will play, uh, you know, the bass player will play a bit of drums, or play a bit of guitar, a bit of keyboards. All, all musicians play a lot of stuff. So it's, there's nothing special uh, about what I'm doing. It is. OK. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> but, um... When did you have more say as to who you were going to work with? Because you know you, you spoke about working with Gus, you spoke about working with with Glyn, yeah. and what you would have picked up and from them, and also who they would have introduced you. Yeah, to. I've always, from day one, I was really seriously lucky to work with Gus Dudgeon as my first producer, yeah. and Gus, who, as I said, wrote uh, uh, produced Elton's early albums, and Elton at that time was selling whatever percentage of all the albums sold, you know, the Taylor Swift of now. <laughs> and um, so Gus could have said, you know, I'm the big deal producer, you just do as I say, but he didn't. He recognized that I knew what I wanted. Yeah. So I was just allowed to do what I do. Mm. But I didn't know the musicians, so he would say, let's get this keyboard player, let's get this drummer, let's... Um, but, but that didn't mean I wasn't involved you know, I was still part of the production of the, the, the thing. And I was, I, I've always written and arranged my songs. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't go into the studio with, with an idea of a song. I go in with a, song. with a song. So I'm not relying on the rest of the musicians to say, OK, here's what the song will be now. The song's written. Um, so, so that part of it is kind of taken care of. And it's the same with, uh, with Glyn. Glyn, <coughs> Glyn Jones, again, you know, these two giants, producers, or how lucky am I that I could work with those guys? But both of them recognised that I knew what I wanted. So I've never had to fight any of that. And I've always wanted the producer to introduce me to people. I've never, I've never really tried to say, you know, I want to work with this person or that person, because they know many more people than I know. Yes. And I'm, I'm likely to get many, many more really good musicians if I listen to them say, this person's good. So you're open, open arms. Absolutely open to it. Um, and you know, I've worked with some, some absolutely great musicians, and I'd, I'd be quite sad if I'd never worked with some of those guys. Um, so no, no forcing of anything there at all. Should we talk about hierarchies? Mm -hmm. Have a look at this. Joan. <laughs> look at this. I mean, hello. What, what memories do you have of these rock aristocracy concerts, <laughs> you know, where you're looking at... There's everybody oh, there. That right. Yeah, I mean, T Tina Turner just... On the throne, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. There's a great picture of me dancing with Paul McCartney at, at this uh, thing. He's kind of got me in his arms like this. Um, Is no, that a good that... dancer? No. Is he nimble? <laughs> Is he nimble? No? Gosh, you are uh, private. You won't even betray that. <laughs> um, no, this was at uh, the Prince's Trust at right. Wembley, uh, Wembley Arena. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, and that was just just a great night. I I, I was I think I, I think I did the very first Prince's Trust kind of gala thing yes. at uh, the Dominion Theatre, um, and it, that was myself, Kate Bush, Madness, um, Jethro Tull. I think Pete Townsend was there, Pop Roger. Um, and then they, we went on and, and then did this one. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, I was really interested in the Prince's Trust because I think the King now, because he started the Trust in 76, um, was just, um, I thought, just a, just a good guy. You know what's so interesting about this period where charity and rock creates these behemoth concerts and um, rock was the rebel. It was never, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it becomes this new, um, yeah. not, you know, stadium filling is, is you know, look at, yeah. look at this sea of people to you, yes. but it, there was this new currency of, yeah. of conscience and of yeah. formativity, you know, on this grand scale. And yeah. I think artists just really wanted to show people that they appreciated where they were. Mm. And the best way of doing that was to be charitable. Right. You know, um, and so artists, anybody, almost anybody could say to an artist, will you help this charity? Will mm. you perform for this charity? Will you just come and support this charity? And most artists would just say yes, without, or almost without thinking. And I was very happy to support lots of different charities then. But I, I, I stayed with the Prince's Trust because, as I said, I think the, the, the Prince then and the King now really, I think, really felt for the things that he was trying to achieve. He really felt for the pe people. And, and when he was talking to, to the youngsters that he was trying to help, I always felt it was never on that kind of, you know, look at me, you know, I'm so trying to help you. Right. It was a proper proper level, proper where it needed to be. And the help that he's given to people has been absolutely incredible. I, I'm talking like this because I, I first got involved with, with the Prince's Trust in uh, 1983, mm -hmm. uh, and then did that and other things, and then became an ambassador, and, then, uh, um, and, the, and I'm now one of the trustees of the Trust. And I can see from the inside how absolutely incredible it is. Yeah. Speaking of change, I mean, how do you go for... Ooh, oh, give me the <laughs> I was like, what's that noise? <laughs> it's right. How, how does the girl from Birmingham, the loner, end up <laughs> hanging out with Nelson Mandela? It's just... Oh, that was absolutely incredible. Mm. Um, I was on tour in South Africa, and I got a call and they said, would you like to meet Nelson Mandela? <laughs> <laughs> and you went... I said... No, no, thank you. <laughs> I was quite, quite busy. <laughs> but um, so, so I first of all went to Robin Island and met some of the guards who had been looking after him, and um, they absolutely adored him, and they wished that they were out with him, look, looking after him now, and mm -hmm. just protecting him because they, they just fell in love with him. Um, and so then after that, I went to his house in Pretoria and I, I thought, oh, it's going to be a whole stack of people there. It's going to be really busy. And you, when you come out of the car to go to the house, it, the, the thing of it hits you. It's like you really feel, it's like a tangible presence. Right. Even before you meet him, it's like, whoa. And um, so I get into the room and he's there and we say hello and we have a little chat. And then he says, do you want to come out into the garden, which is where we took that picture? And, he, and I thought, oh, okay, that's where everybody the else is. is. Just me and him party for the whole visit. It was just the two of us. It's great. Are you holding a copy of Walk to Freedom? Yeah, he gave me that book. Yeah, and signed it for me. <laughs> I got John to sign my book. <laughs> Not the same, but <laughs> okay. So let me get this straight. So you meet Nelson Mandela. Well, actually, an interesting thing about that is that I've met Mr. Cathadra and his wife and mm. other freedom fighters, yeah. and they told me that when they were in prison, uh, before they went to prison and they were going across the border to Swaziland and different places, they would play my music. And, <laughs> um, and, and so th that's why the 
the connection. Yeah. You know. And you have to admire all these other guys because, as he would say, he wasn't the only person who helped um, the black guys to be, yeah. yeah. Nelson Mandela, the Beano. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. You look at your face, you're <laughs> even prouder of that. Yeah, I, I've read the Beano since I was this little seven-year-old, and I absolutely love, I still read the Beano, by the way. I still, ab absolutely, I get the, the annual every year, the Beano, the Dandy, or Willie. I used to get M Bunty, Mandy, Beano, Wizard and Chip. <laughs> I, <laughs> I got them all. <laughs> and then one day, Another phone call, would you like to come to the Beano office in Scotland? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Took a chat, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I didn't know this was going to happen, but then they put me in uh, the, the comic with this sketch. <laughs> well, I think because you've exclusively revealed that you have a new album out, um, at the bottom it says, after we've eaten all this, Sally, we'll listen to my new album. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of new creations, last year, Symphony Number no. One. Yeah. You composed. A I watched musicians perform your work, and it was. And you were in the. Tell us about this as your own measure of your own endeavor. This was something that you felt that you needed to do. Yeah, this was something I I knew I would do mm. at some point. I didn't know when that point would be, but I knew I would do it. And then one day, I was just in my studio, and that was the day. I didn't even, I didn't plan it. I didn't think, let me try and see if I can do this. I just started it and, and finished it. That's the way to do it. And um, it was, <laughs> it, it, it's, I mean, I say this, and, and sometimes I think, you know, shut up, Joan. But it's not as difficult as it's supposed to be. No, no, I'm you not know. gonna tell you to shut up, but. <laughs> no, when I, when, I, when I say that, what, what I mean is, to me, it's just music. Right. So although it's a different kind of challenge, mm. it's, it's a diff you have to think differently. Yes. Um, and it's not that you just do it and it's like that. But it doesn't feel as I said before, to me, it doesn't feel as a big deal in the doing of it. I'm very proud that I've done it. Yes. I'm really proud that people seem to have enjoyed it. Mm. I certainly liked it. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I loved the experience of yes. doing it. Um, and I loved hearing the Chinake Orchestra play it. They, and you're they just down there, on, yeah. you know, on the uh, audience's yeah. right, just... Yeah. It's, it's teeming with... People. Skill. <laughs> yeah, th but uh, again, well, you know, you're looking at very talented, uh, very talented people. But this is doing what you wanted from the age of, from a teenager. Yes. Other people doing yes. the music. Yes, yes. Oh, that was, I, I absolutely loved, loved that. I loved being in the audience and watching the, the performance. Uh, I, I loved the, the audience reaction to it. Mm. Um, and it's great. It's me, I'm, I'm able to just sit back and just, just enjoy it. I've got no... No pressures, yeah. you, you don't know. have to plug anything. I don't have to plug anything in. <laughs> I don't have to strum anything. That's yeah, it's, it's good, and it's something that I'm. Uh, I'll be doing more of. <laughs> Too exclusive. <laughs> Joan, look, everyone's humming of the beauty radiating from the screen. So you <laughs> you performed with Little Sims at the Baftas. Mm -hmm. um, was that another? Do you want to perform? Yes. One of those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Which is something I never say very, yes. don't really say. Yeah, yes. You don't do that. No, one. Not really. But um, I really like her music. <laughs> so I said yes. It was, it was great. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. She's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, I'm a trading. I'm going to now unleash you to the adoration of your paying customers. Thank you so much for this evening. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
No, Joan, you may not go. Does anyone have any questions? There are roving mics. You might want to wait until the mic comes to you. Oh, 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 oh. I can barely see you. Just you're going to dislocate your wrist waving in that way. Thank you. Um, Joan, it's such an amazing pleasure to be here and listen to you. Um, I'll get to my question. Uh, Jacqueline touched on it in that you come from a city that is so deep in reggae, and there's somebody of UB40 on the TV the other day saying, well, it's reggae all around me, there's nothing else I could do. And then also with the rock. But you came up with such an individual style. Um, how, did that, how did that happen that you came with that, you know, for example, you, you weren't overwhelmed with the reggae. And as part of that, <laughs> do you write songs or do you write poems? So there's not two things. I, I write songs. You write songs. And people say yeah. I write poems, but I, I, I definitely write songs. Um, I, I just came up with how I um, write just by doing it. it. Wasn't by design. Wasn't by, no. There's no planning. And as I said before, because I knew I wanted to hear all the different parts that happened in a song, I would play like that. Um, I didn't grow up. Well, I think my. I, 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 Trying to remember because I wasn't listening to lots of stuff. I was, as I said before, I was more into um, comedy than music. Music was in me to come out, but it wasn't. I wasn't constantly listening to music. Even today, I don't constantly listen to music. You know, when I would go on tour and we'd be on the tour bus, the band would be non-stop from the beginning of the journey to the end to the getting to the dressing room. They've been listening to music all that though. Drive me mad. I can't do that. <laughs> too much output. It, it's too much for me. I'm too busy, you know, wanting to write it. So um, no, I just I just didn't did my thing. I wasn't I wasn't even conscious I was doing my thing, really. I was just doing it. Just living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one just at the back there. Um, I've seen you play live twice, and the Ooh. first time was Where's Black that coming Country. from? Oh, just over there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've seen you play live twice. The first was actually at Blackbush. Um, how important is, is playing live to you, and do you plan a, a tour in the near future? Play, playing live um, is quite important in that people want to see whichever artist it is, they want to see them live so that they can prove to them they can do it. <laughs> um, and also it's that um, feeling of togetherness when people are in an audience and they're looking at this one person that, or the group that they like. They like to feel everybody else is there. So that's a, it's a very kind of together feeling. That's, that's really nice. And I, I enjoyed that part of it as being part of making that happen. Um, I don't remember the I think it was the Rolling Stones or somebody said they don't want to see themselves on stage when they were 40. They were probably in their 20s then <laughs> when they say that. <laughs> Another lie. <laugh. laughs> but I I don't think I want to be on stage when I'm 80. It's not that far off. Uh, I don't think I want to. So I, I haven't got any plans to 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 tour just now. Um, but I. Do, I did absolutely enjoy touring uh, and I'm very grateful to everybody who came to see me. Thank you. <laughs> there were, there was, um... I've got um, a microphone here. Can I ask a question? Um, just say thank you. It's been, ama it's been really amazing. And Joan, I'm just interested because there's been a lot spoken about um, how you observe and that's how you write your music. Um, has the way you observe changed as you've enjoyed more success as you've got older, are you able to observe in the same way you did when you were younger and maybe could kind of go more incognito and, and be, be not recognised? Uh, I observed the same way. Um, people are looking at me, but they don't think I'm looking at them. <laughs> so I'm able, I'm able to observe. My question is about your creatives. You talked so much about creatives. This is fabulous, by the way. Um, but 
who do you look at beyond music and what are the other spheres of creativity that influence you or that you take pleasure in right now? What is the bits, apart from Little Sims, <laughs> that you love? And can I tell you, I first came across you as part of the netball team of a very mixed gang um, from Antigua, I've got an Irish right. background, Jamaica, in Huddersfield in the early 70s. <laughs> nice. And you were the basis of a row <laughs> about what album got played at the school <laughs> disco. And you won. You won. And we always remember Joan Armatrade. <laughs> Well, if, if you're asking who, her, which artist I really like at the moment, is that the question you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I like Post Malone. I like Wiz Khalif. I, I do like Ed Sheeran. Um, I like, loved Amy Winehouse. I thought she was absolutely fantastic. Um, I tend to like quite a mixture of artists. Um, it, it's, it's eclectic and it shows in the, in the things that I write. So, but sometimes people think, oh, why do you like Wiz Khalif? Why do you like rap? But there's lots of actually really good rap. But Ka Kanye West is maybe out of favor at the moment, but actually he writes some great songs and says some really good things in his songs as well. So sometimes people get a bit confused with rap and the image of rap. They forget to listen to what's being said and, and, and sung. There's one over there and there's a lady here. Did you want it? No? Yes. I just want to know when you're going to start your rock and roll band. <laughs> Before you retire, please. What's a rock and roll band? I don't know, but some, somebody... Name in it. Somebody um, asked me if I was going to write a heavy metal uh, album. <laughs> and uh, I love heavy metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I like everything. <laughs> I like everything. But but he wrote in the article that I was going to write a heavy metal album. So now I have to keep saying no. I'm not going to write a heavy metal. I just like it. <laughs> There's a lady down here in emerald green. And somebody across. Anticipation. Mm -hmm. The pressure, the question's got to be strong. Uh, the no. way you, you've described your <laughs> She was just being, she was just being funny. She was just like, no, whatever you're going to say. Go ahead. The way you've described your story, you started writing when you were 12, 13. Um, you had these songs that wanted to come out of you. You um, somehow got a uh, recording deal. Then you went touring. And it just... It doesn't sound true, does it? Well, no, it sounds so easy. It, and, I, and I cannot believe that, given how original and different you were, um, that it was that easy. And I, I'm just cur genuinely curious about how much um, ambition and drive you had to have to, to do what you wanted to do in the way you wanted to do it. And um, were there people who you relied on to support you, to actually get you to that first step of getting the, um, the recording deal so you could get your, the songs that you wanted to be heard, heard? I know it sounds like it's not right, <laughs> but, but, it but it is right. <laughs> and because I'm just being me, and I'm kind of not the sort of person that you can pressure, I don't, you know, I don't, and I think people just bought into that. I think they just thought, oh, Joan's not gonna be pressured, let's just let her do what she's doing. I, I, so I didn't have a lot of, um, a, apart from them saying, you know, you, you've got to change your name and you've got to dress this way and you should sing somebody else's songs, but I never did. And, and because I'm not doing it, that they, they they stop because I'm obviously not going to do it. So I don't have lots of, you must sing this song. Um, so it, I, I just don't feel that pressure to, to do what, I just don't, I, I haven't got it, sorry. 
<laughs> I don't think you should apologise. I think we're, we're quite used to a story of apprenticeships up and down the motorways, of trauma, of this, exact. But you were, you were a band of one. Yeah, um, and, you, you, you know, there's lots of people you asked to who, who support me. Lots of, you can't... I do lots of things on my own. I write on my own, I play all the stuff, I record, I engineer, I produce. I do all of that on my own, but I can't do everything. So you have to have people who are with you to support you. Like, you have to have DJs who will play your record. You have to have a record company who put out the record. You have to have somebody in the record company that says, yeah, we're going to stay with this. So you, you have to have all of those things. But while you have all of those things, you don't need to kind of bow to everything that they ask you just because they're helping you. It, do you know what I mean? It's, you need to be grateful, and I'll always mention those people. I always mention John Peel and Johnny Walker, Paul Gamachini. I always, always mention people because I'm very grateful that they were there to allow people to hear what I'm doing. But at the same time, I don't feel that because that's happening, I must, whatever they suggest, I must do. Uh, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Time for one more question. Oh, up here, hello. Oh, oh do you have any on, online? Oh, apparently we've got 10 minutes, so, oh. you know. Oh. <laughs> this can be a comment or a question. We, we've actually got time to well, accommodate can, uh, that horror story. <laughs> she get I've been bobbing up and down here for a while. <laughs> Thank you for this really beautiful, inspiring conversation. Joan, how do you feel about being an LGBTQAI plus icon? <laughs> Who's this? <laughs> Who are you? I'm an I'm Get an out of here. <laughs> Next question. Oh, is that your answer? That's my answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, got an online question? But the mic is... Oh, we can't hear you, John. Okay. Oh, this. Oh, there's a question down here. Oh, oh. I'm, I'm close, so I'm just going to yell it out. Okay. Oh, no. I have. Okay. A, sorry, can you get the mic? Oh, oh yeah, for online. We got, we got one here. Oh, you don't want one. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering, with this great career, these many albums. Is there something besides just do it just right that you would tell to younger folks who are just starting out now as songwriters and performers? Sorry, can you say that again? Sorry. Is like advice you would have for young oh. young people starting out who want to get into music? Um, well, I, I'd say to them, be true to yourself. Um, if you want to get into music, know that you love music and you know what you're doing because sometimes people can kind of fool themselves and sometimes can be fooled by other people who will say, darling, you're wonderful, you sing so beautifully. But of course they don't. So it's quite good if you know that you're good at it. And then if you're good at it, just do it. The, 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 the world now is so different to when I started. There is YouTube. You can put out your music yourself. You can build up your fan base yourself. You can record things yourself. You, can, you don't necessarily need, I personally think you do, but you don't necessarily need to have a record company anymore to um, get yourself known. You can book gigs uh, yourself, you know. So the opportunity to just be in this thing is so much greater than it was uh, in, in the early days. So if you, if you know that this is something you really passionately want to do, um, then you should definitely do it, but always knowing that you're not fooling yourself. John, are you ready for online? Sorry. Okay, we've got one over there. Hi. Um, you've talked about how you've tried and developed lots of different musical writing. Have you any desire to take your word writing in any other directions? Um, I've kind of thought about it. I've thought about maybe writing something, but I'm too busy writing songs. <laughs> Joan Armour trading sitcom would really hit. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> radio drama. <laughs> and commissioning off the bat on radio. I really think they would. She's actually a riot. She's very I'm, I'm up for it. We've got a nice question from uh, Sarah or Sarah, who remembers an early gig, uh, not the... Uh, 
netball team one. <laughs> um, so this was, I remember seeing it at Ronnie Scott's when I was about 18, so about 1974, on the bill with Cecil Taylor. You wore jeans, yeah, yeah, a white yeah. T-shirt, and a door key around your neck. You yeah. were great. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any remember memories of that gig and of Cecil? Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, Cecil was great. Cecil was the only person who could break piano strings. <laughs> I've never seen anybody else do that. It was quite incredible, but fantastic guy. Um, Ronnie Scott's was I, was, I was the first non-jazz person to play at Ronnie Scott's downstairs. Um, and it was, uh, it was quite exciting to, to, be, playing, to, be, to be playing there. It was, it was, it was great. Um, yeah, I remember it, remember it very, very well. And I've played there quite a few times. Um, and the key around my neck was because when I was growing up, I would have to let myself in when I got home. <laughs> You're a latchkey kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lovely. And I wrote, I wrote an album called The Key, and then I stopped wearing the key. <laughs> I asked Joan if she would nominate her favourite song, and we were going to hear it and watch the video if it was thus blessed. And what did you say to me? I said it's on the new album. <laughs> so, I thought we'd have a plot twist and make the British <laughs> Library a little less... Um, make it a little bit more raucous and invite you all, by Dane of Noise, to nominate the song that you would like to play out and we'll watch the video. I'm assuming it's going to be Love and Affection. Yeah. Well, you have two deaf, eh? Well, you, you know all of them, so you make a choice. Guide your audience. No. There we go. Oh. It's like a pub, isn't yeah. it? It's just... It's... Like, Promise Land. Promise Land. Yeah, they're, they're all great songs, guys. <laughs> And you got the publishing. We should have talked about it. Um, so which one, Joan? Which one? You um, I quite, I quite like the weakness in me, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's right. not a, it's not a. It could have been that or drop the pilot, but I quite like that. Okay. Well, Sav. Oh. Can we have one to come on pub? Oh. There's another one. <laughs> uh, they're all great we songs. We can't do a mega mix. <laughs> None of your rap friends are here to help us. But um, Sav's going to queue up. Which one is he queuing up? He's the weakness in me. Oh, I love it's, the way it's he a bit... bleeds those <laughs> bunny eyes. OK. The weakness in me, Sav. Signing some books, um, and thank you all for coming. And Joan, yes, I'm a thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And Joan, I'm a trader. <laughs> You're looking at me with eyes. I'm like, this, this bet. My comment now, better slap it. Better. Okay. <laughs> thank you for making our presence on earth better with your music. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So,